Greetings, Reek Rats, and welcome to Season 4, Episode 12 of the Blackhawks Raincast, coming to you live from the Puck Hockey Studios and brought to you by Puck Hockey, our founding and official sponsor since 2017. Head over to puckhockey.com and check out the latest in hockey-themed apparel and gear. Really cool stuff, beautifully designed and well-made. I am your host, John Jekyll, better known across the interwebs as JJ or that Jekyll guy. With me tonight are two of the usual suspects, uh, Andy Campbell. How's it going, man? Hey, what's happening, everybody? Good to see you all again. And also coming to us from the nether regions of his basement, um, or somewhere in his house anyway, um, the blogger to be named later, Sean Fitzgerald, also known as Sean Goldstein. Sean, talk to me. Great to be here. Um, I wore tonight's hat in honor of Ray, who did not Ooh. show up. The World Series Tampa Bay Rays hat, the World Series one from last year's World Series appearance, told Ray I would do it. It's not here. In honor of Ray, the deserter. The, the deserter. Whatever what he is, I don't know. I don't, I don't know, know what's going on with Ray. I think he's busy these days, but we'll get him back on here soon enough. Yeah, I'd like to hear his, his uh, sweet sweet hockey thoughts yes they're always they're always very sweet um, <laughs> until it comes his, to, it comes to ian mitchell his first his first names ian and wyatt and yeah, stuff right. like that so that's right so one of these days we'll unpack uh ray's nomenclature his his naming conventions for uh for hawk players it's it's pretty brilliant actually it's classic ray anyway but that's for another show tonight. We're going to cover the state of the Hawks at will, what will soon be the season's end, the retirement of Andrew Shaw, the extension of Riley Stillman, and related topics. We also have a few questions tonight as well. So strap it in, hold on tight. You're in for a hell of a ride here on Recast 4.12. All right, let's get started. Um, state of the Hawks at what will soon be the season's end. Um, it looks as though um, the Hawks have uh, our are fading fast from the playoff picture, gentlemen. Um, I believe that uh, the uh, management of the team uh, made a conscious choice um, to, uh, to, you know, sell off some assets at the trade deadline, uh, playoffs be damned. And frankly, I salute them for that because I don't feel that uh, there was much to be gained from uh, squeaking into the playoffs to be squashed like a bug at the hands of the Tampa Bay lightning. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what are we looking at here? I mean, there's, there's some, some robust debate, Sean. You and I engaged in a little bit of it today on the Twitters regarding, you know, is, is the team improved? Um, would the team, you know, be better if uh, Jonathan Taves and Kirby Doc had been here, for, here all year? Um, you know, um, was the first half of the year the, 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 the exciting, growing, improving Hawks, or was the second half of the year more of the same over the last four years? Um, and uh, I think we could go on uh, about this quite at, at great length, um, and maybe we will. Let's start with Andy. Man, such a tough question. I would love to give the Hawks and the organization the benefit of the doubt and just say, ooh, maybe this is the beginning of something. And I don't know. It's always hard to tell, too, in such a condensed season. I mean, I think you saw some guys come out of the gate flying early, and then I don't know if it was because of the schedule compression or what have you that some of them faded off. Guy that Philip Philip Kurashev came out, guns blazing. Everyone's like, "Oh my God, who is this kid?" And now, you know, you kind of forget when he's out there <laughs> when you're watching games recently. You know, he's kind of had a wake up call and tailed off a little bit. So. That, Hard to know if that's the schedule, hard to know if it's this kid came in hot, you know, playing in the Swiss league. And all of a sudden now the NHL guys, once they got 10, 15 games in are like, okay, now we can catch a kid. Um, so it depends on who these young guys really grow to be. Um, you know, I think the Hawks have, uh, and I know we've talked about in previous podcasts, they have a little bit more ammunition to play with going into the draft going into the expansion draft. You know, it, it, it all depends on who's taken what their moves are going to be after that. So many signs with the Stillman signing now point towards Calvin DeHaan, but who's to say um, whether he's protected or whether he goes. Um, but honestly, I, you know, with the Hawks and how they've been trending lately, um, I am a skeptic. I am going to be a doubter. I am going to say this is going to be a problem for a long time. And I'm happy to be wrong if that's the case. And honestly, you know, it's talk is cheap with the Hawks right now. 
you know, talk all you want, Stan, throughout all the superlatives about all the young guys, even the sweet superlatives you put out there about Mitchell. And now we're finding out more who he isn't versus who he is. And uh, enough talking. Let's see if you can do it. And if you can't, um, you know, then I don't know. It'll be a letdown. But would love to feel positive about it. I do like the Stillman signing because it's cheap labor. But other than that, um, you know, just kind of blah right now. <laughs> Another blah ending to a season. Yeah. Sean, what do you think, man? Yeah. Like we said on the Twitter verse earlier, JJ, um, they still allow way too many shots per game. They allow 33, which is third in the NHL. They only, they only produce 23 shots a game, which is 28th in the NHL. So they allow too many shots. They're not putting a lot of shots on net. This is all five on five too. Um, I think like Andy said, a lot of guys came out hot early. Uh, Kevin Lankin in, came out really smoking hot once he got his opportunity and Jeremy Carlton pulled him in um, Wednesday's game against Nashville I believe, or Monday's game. Oh. I, think I pulled Monday's game because then Malcolm Subban got the next two starts. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot of questions. Uh, Riley, the Riley Stillman signing, does it signal the end of Nikita Zadorov's time in Chicago? They're kind of the same player. Riley Stillman is at one point, Three million, I believe. Zadorov's cap hit this year was three point two, and he's due to get a raise. So does that signal the end? Also, um, in my recap, I wrote about Andy's favorite guy, Dylan Strom, yeah. who, when facing a team that they scored the least amount of goals per game against this season, and had the National Predators also have, I, I believe they're in the top five in faceoff percentage. You take away Dylan Strom, who faults you for what? He only had one point in the last five games, but he still hit 47% at the faceoff dot, and he's still a forward. Instead, you go with a seventh defenseman against a team you have trouble scoring goals against. It's it's mind blowing. I I don't understand that move at all. I think it's probably gonna. I think that's probably the divorce. Like Dylan Strome, I think is going to be gone. I think they're going to trade him in the offseason. Well, then if that's the move, that's great. And if that's like, <laughs> if that's the message that Colleton is sending all of us, that he's like, well, we're not going to play Dylan Strome because Chicago needs to fall. The few of you that actually like him need to fall out of in love with him, so I can have an excuse to move him, and management does too. Then, then a plus to seven defensemen every night. Yeah, um, if it, some might call the departure of Dylan <laughs> from addition by subtraction. I mean, we're talking about we're, that's one of our, one of their only centers, and we talk about a team that has no center depth whatsoever. You know, with a with a six million dollar extension over the summer, and he's a healthy scratch. The healthy scratch in two out of the three games where you had to win to keep your playoff dreams right. alive. Like tells you, add, every, tells you everything you need to know about Dylan Strom right there. And it's yeah. So I question guys on the roster right now: Zadorov, Strom. I'm saying right now that they're probably going to move them in the offseason. I, I want them to move this door off. Uh, even though they won Wednesday night's game, his turnover was egregious. Like, it was so incredibly bad. So, I the state of the Hawks right now, I think they're – the second half of the season is what is what they are. They were buoyed earlier by a strong power play, a red-hot goaltender, and now as those things have – regress towards the mean this is who they are yeah, played themselves out of a lottery pick <laughs> yep they were they were good enough just to not yeah. just to uh, not be so, bad enough. yeah you know when we uh when we when we uh did a i think we did a, a mid-season back in february we sort of did a mid-season assessment of the hawks and it was around the time i had written a blog where i cited three or four areas where the hawks had been overperforming you know, one was the goaltending, two was the power play, three was three on three overtime. Um, and, you know, uh, and at the time, I think we all agreed that, that, that in all of those areas, they probably were going to come back to earth. And they did. I mean, I was just looking up Lankin and stats. I mean, at that time, Lankin was in the 920s yeah. for a safe percentage. He had, the, he had the Calder trophy, like, sitting on his mantle. Yeah, and now he's like 0.913, 2.89 goals against average. Just pretty pedestrian now. In fairness to him, um, the Hawks, um, as of yesterday, I believe yesterday or, or yeah, probably yesterday, were um, they were they were almost five shots a game underwater in shots for shots against. 
And that is as bad as it's been in, is, is that I can remember. I mean, this is probably going back to like 2007 um, when it's been that bad. I mean, this has been a trend, you know, this increasing um, underwater shot differential. Um, you know, the five on five play is really bad. Um, they're 82 and 97, five on five. Uh, shot our goals for goals against um Yikes. so i guess what i come back to you know and we got a question tonight about you know what what if what if they'd have had tapes and what if they'd have had doc the whole season um and we'll, we'll come we'll you know before before we get to the questions um you know we won't we won't go too deep into that but it just i i have to say and we and sean and i got into it a little bit with uh with one of our um our, our twitter folks um today about it um who had cited you know that they that they had seen improvement and i guess i'm i'm still willing to go out and say that that maybe lankinen is a keeper um or at least you know he's he's probably better than anything they've had other than Corey crawford or robin leonard the last five years and he's young um and he may have some upside yet so um you know being in the nhl for a while etc um but it's it seems to me that uh Overall, the um, the trajectory of the team is not as improving, I think, as people would like to believe. I, I think they they still have the same problems, and we're going to come. I think we're also going to have to touch on tonight this this sort of uh, um, uh, what's prophesied return of Jonathan Taves next year, yeah. um, and how realistic that is. We're going to talk about that because without him coming back, I don't see this. I don't see the kind of improvement that this team needs unless Bowman is able to do some things in the off season. Um, and, you know, but again, I will, I will congratulate them and, and, and salute them for doing the right thing and trading off those guys and not trying to squeak into a playoff spot. They did the right thing for the future of the franchise and, and they have to be uh, recognized for, as such. Um, so at, any more thoughts you guys on this, on this particular broad topic? Well, I, I just, it, I, you know, it's all, it's, it's nice. Like we said, I mean, it's nice that young guys are, are able to jump in there and some of them got a lot more time than we thought. Hagel came out of nowhere um, and had a year, you know, no one had him on the radar <clears throat> except for this podcast. Um, yeah. I like to say that except for the guys here. Um, but at any rate, I mean, and, and that whole argument of, Oh, well, what if they had Taves or what if they had doc, you know, if they, if they had a hundred percent Taves coming off of last year, would it just be another year where we see Taves being overextended in so many different roles on the ice and the young guys not chipping in because he's first team PK, first team P PP. He's the only one winning dots. So they put him out there all the time and they just wear him out because that's, that's what he, that's unfortunately had to be in his role in recent years. You know, then I don't know if we would have been able to, to see some of these young guys get the auditions that they needed. So, you know, the Lincoln and things great. I mean, but if Ray were here, he'd say, Hey, they, they're going to get a book on him. And they did. Yeah. You know, they're going to get the book on the goalie. So I don't know who's going to be, you know, if there's anyone even remotely interesting out there uh, goalie wise, I, I, I don't know if you can roll with, with Lankin and Subban again. Um, and I'm also not, you know, Gates going to hate me for this. I'm not also not supporting the, the Colin Delia argument either. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, there, if there's any other goalies coming off, you know, that are going to be UFAs. There's some decent ones, you know, there's Dubnik, Anderson, Rene Rask. I don't, they certainly don't, they might not have the the change to make a run at someone like that, but is that worth thinking about? We'll see. I think, um, yeah, I don't see them doing that. Honestly. No. We talked about this in the chat the other day too, or I believe Juliana and Eric were talking about it. The improvement on defense of Adam Boquist. I think yeah. that's a big plus for the season. Um, like I've said that this season is always about development and it should be about forward leading and forward thinking. So I will credit the Blackhawks for improving Adam Boquist's defense, at least significantly. He still may not be a Norris candidate ever, but if he's a serviceable defenseman that, with offensive upside, that that's good. Like that's a positive. Uh, Wyatt Galchenyuk, I believe that's how you say his name. If not, Gata Lovett that I butchered his name. Alanuk? Yes, he looked oh. good offensively. I still think he has a lot to be desired on the back end, but yeah. and and credit Stan Bowman for forward thinking moves. Like he, whether it's um, Brett Connolly, I almost called him Brent again, Eric. Brett Connolly 
could be exposed in the, in the uh, expansion draft. Like he made moves for the future. He didn't do yeah. the, nope. we're going to give up two second round picks for David Runblad or right. something like that. He didn't make moves for the present to try to chase the playoffs. So I gotta, I gotta give him credit for that. And hopefully that some of these younger guys who took a step back, they can work in the off season, develop more of their game. We yeah. still need more, more all-terrain forwards, but at least yeah, I'm, I'm curious what they decide to do with, with Alex Nylander. Um, I now, think now, gonna... I, now I would not categorize him as an all terrain forward. <laughs> That's no. for sure. No, I certainly wouldn't do that, but I mean, I don't, I mean, he's an RFA at the end of this year. Do you try to move him and get, I don't know, a puck bag in return or, you know, I don't something think they're going to get anything. He's no. come up a really bad injury. Yeah. I don't think, I think it's... he wasn't exactly, you know, ripping it up prior to that. It, I mean, it... But we're all we're also we're also talking about the same the same GM that you know did resign Strom as an RFA for two years at six mil. So when he has his favorites, he throws money at him for whatever reason. Yeah, that's now why that like it's not going anywhere. Right. I mean, I'm almost I'm almost more scared for the Hawks when Stan Bowman has more cap space to work with. It's like, what is he going to do? Yeah. Is he going to is he going to use this wisely, or is he just going to you know aimlessly toss it around and throw darts at a dartboard? Yeah. Um, you know, the thing that we were also talking in the chat, you know, I mean, it is good to see Boquist take a little step up, you know, yeah. I think the question that remains though about him and really about the entirety of the defense outside of the third, soon to be 39 year old Duncan Keith um, is, you know, where are the next elite players coming out of that defense? I, I'm not sold that Boquist is even necessarily going to be a top pairing guy. I mean, he may be a top pairing guy on a bad Hawk defense, but it's all about context, right? I mean, um, I, it, it remains to be seen. Is he just going to be, you know, a, a, an interesting, you know, offensive defenseman who's just good enough defensively um, to be, you know, he could be, he could be paired with um, somebody who's a little more stay at home, maybe even Riley Stillman or somebody like that. Right. Um, yeah, I don't, I totally agree with you, JJ. I think that, I'm sorry, I just totally cut you off again. Cause I've been really good, I've been really good at it lately. Um, that used that used to be Sean more. Now I've I have I have taken that championship cutoff belt. It's all good. It's all uh, good. But I, I with, with Boquist, I mean, if if you have a defenseman who's struggling, you notice that he's struggling. If you have a good and solid defenseman, you don't notice him at all. Right. And if you have an elite defenseman, you notice how he takes over games. That's why I used to call Nicholas Jalmers in the furnace because you would right. only notice him if he broke down. Yeah, exactly. And, and I don't you'd ever think about him. You right. know, that's been the beauty of Boquist lately is since he's come back from that original injury, it's like, wow, no one really notices him that much because he's solid and he's yeah. been playing, he's been playing well, but yeah. I don't, will he become that elite? And uh, I don't yeah. know. And I, I, I don't know. And, and I think there, you know, let's face it, Hawk fans, many of you took for granted that everybody Bowman drafted in the last five years was going to step up and be the next Kane, be the next Keith, be the next Eric Carlson it usually doesn't work out that way, guys. And <laughs> we're kind of seeing that, you know, the other thing I'll say about, about Bowman and the Hawks, and it, certainly we're going into well, well-trodden territory here, but I'm going to say it again, you know, the trade that uh, Steve Eiserman pulled off, um, I guess it was last week, you know, trading Anthony Mantha and getting Jakub Vrana and um, a first round pick and a second round pick. And then Vrana you know, goes out and basically looks like Pavel Bure, you know, in, in the, in a winged uniform. Um, you know, that's the difference. I mean, I think that, I think Bowman, again, you know, has, has, is doing the right things, but he's doing them on a small scale, you know, where a guy like Iserman is coming in and he's making big changes. And you could argue that Yarmo Kekalainen did the same thing at, at the, at the trade deadline. And I feel like, you know, it goes back to our, our, you know, what we our our saw, if you will, that old chestnut that we always bat around. And that is, you know, until the Hawks decide to really rebuild, they're not really rebuilding. And, right. um, you know, I, 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 and I think the results are year after year continue to show us. I mean, I, I you know, did a little uh, audit the other day. And, you know, I think the Hawks are going to finish 10th in the West. You know, that's where they finished two years ago. They were 12th last year. So I guess 10th is an improvement from 12th. Um, you know, minus 14 right now in goal differential. Um, you know, the horrible five on five, et cetera. So again, I feel like, I, I don't know. I don't think, I don't think there's anything to be super optimistic about, except for the fact that Bowman does seem to be on a very small 
baby steps kind of way doing the right things. But I, I, I feel like, you know, the question is, when is Danny Wirtz going to, going to let him actually do some, you know, make the bigger moves that are really necessary. And until then, I think we're going to have the same stupid conversation every year until, until they, you know, they're going to try to sell tickets on Kane and Keith and Keith until they're 65 years old. Yeah. They may have to, I mean, I don't Are, are we, are we overlooking or maybe we're just omitting it um, for the big rebuild? Remember the no movement clauses that Kane and Keith both have. So they, they, they have to agree to leave. Like they can't just be traded. And I think that's what I, that's hindering, in my opinion, Stan Bowman from the big rebuild. Anthony I, Mantha didn't have a no movement clause. No, I mean, it's, it's possible that that's hindering, but I don't, you know, I, <laughs> I mean, and I, you know, I get it. If they really wanted to leave, they'd probably beat down the door and be like, get me out of here. We're gone. But and at the same time, I don't, I don't know if management has actively pursued like guys, like have they had the con has right. like Stan Bowman had the I conversation? I, don't I, think I, I would doubt it. I don't that's think what I'm thinking. Okay. I just I, wanted to throw that out that. there just to make sure. And I think that, I think, you know, and again, I, 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 I totally feel you, Shawnee, but yeah. yeah. So I go I ahead. Don't these guys personally, I, I don't know their agents, but I, I got to believe if they'd have gone to them this year, if they go to them this summer, if they go to the next season and say, look, we have an opportunity to move you to, um, you know, a Vegas or to a um, Tampa Bay or, you know, a team with a legit cup shot, um, you know, w- would you wave? And, and you know what? I got a feeling both, either one of those guys would do it. I, I really do. Um, because they're not going to win a cup in Chicago again. They're not. Um, unless they're playing, unless, you know, Kane's playing until he's, I guess, you know, 38, 39, and, and Keith is playing well into his forties. They're not going to. Um, yeah, I think and, it's a double-edged sword. I think, I think, I think it's twofold. I think one, they don't want to leave and two management doesn't want them to leave either. And I just right. don't. Yeah. I, right. I, I think they don't, I think that yeah, all things being equal, they'd probably rather stay. But yeah. I also think that if the team came to them and said, look, we've got an opportunity to move you to a team, that has a chance to win a cup. You've still got a great contract, um, you know, in both cases, uh, you know, Kane more so than Keith. Um, I, 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 I got a feeling that either or both of them would do it, you know, mm-hmm. especially if, if the team was, was, was respectful about it and the way they approached them. I mean, Nick Foligno did it. Nick Foligno is so wired into Columbus. It's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, I mean, it happened. But, These things get waived. They do. Nick Foligno, Nick Foligno might do the, he will. He, we're going to come back and sign a, sign with Columbus after his stint in Toronto yeah, anyway. Will. So yeah, will. Makes, makes sense. So anyway, we're, we're going down that, we're going down that path again tonight and we've got a lot of other stuff to talk about. So um, the next thing is the retirement of Andrew Shaw. I, I'm not the least bit um, surprised about that. And I guess it's a, this is possibly a segue into a discussion about the other announcement that kind of got pushed to the, to the back burner or the back page a little bit, which was, the, the Darren Dreger breathless report that Jonathan Taves could be back next year if he continues to progress medically. Um, I've got some really strong opinions about this because I'm smelling I'm smelling something rotten in this. Um, and I, th- I feel like the team is the team is not being forthright with the fans about this. And I feel like they haven't been for a while now that I've, I've observed this thing unfold. A little bit and I'm going to share that and I, I'm sure some people will be offended and not agree but I'm sorry there's just some there's some big missing pieces here and it's at this point you, you have to say why are these pieces missing because somebody wants them missing but I'm gonna turn it over to you guys Andy oh we going Shaw or Taves Shaw uh both if you want oh, okay sure uh Shaw um it was coming it was coming I mean I I, I think I think anyone who's been following Shaw and been following the Hawks the last few years, the writing's on the wall. Um, you know, I, it's a shame. And again, I, you know, we, it's, it's a, it's a year when Crawford, Seabrook, Shaw, possibly Taves. I mean, that's it. It's gone. I mean, the mileage on these guys and um, you know, and what they put out uh, during the glory years and what they played through and the things that, you know, we didn't know that they played through and potentially the things that they were asked to play through that we don't know about either. Um, but it's a shame that it's coming to a crashing halt. He's smart uh, to do it. Uh, whether, you know, I, I did watch the little segment on him that the Hawks put out 
you know, at the age of 29, if you're having these issues and you need to look in the mirror, you need to shut it down. Um, so, you know, I guess uh, mature thinking on his part, if he's the one that made the call on that, you know, who knows if he would have passed another physical or if he was, you know, dying to play again. But I mean, if the people around him are telling him, we really don't think you should do this anymore in 29, he's doing the right thing. Very sad. Um, but, you know, for a guy who was passed over in the draft twice to go in the fifth round yeah. to play 10 years of hockey in the two cities you play in two cups, two cups and you play in Montreal and Chicago. Yeah. And at 29, you said, all right, it's been a slice. And, and I think I'm in good enough shape to, to have a good quality of life, um, which we all hope that he is. And he made $20 million too. Right. Yeah. Nice chunk of change. Your family's in good shape. Um, a plus to him for making this decision on his own, if he did. And um, yeah, sure. We're going to miss the mud. Big fan favorite, you know, big energy guy. But again, you know, the shelf life on those guys isn't, isn't very long. I mean, is that Hagel in five years? You know, I mean, you know, the, the way that some of these guys play and, and to stay in the league, it was, it was, it was interesting when, when they showed those Shaw clips today, when they had his announcement where they, the first thing that they showed as an organization was his first fight. Yeah. It's like, here, here's a guy who's retiring early at 29 from concussions. And you're like, let's show his first fight. It's like, okay, maybe it shouldn't, maybe that shouldn't be the first thing you show, or maybe it is. I don't know, but it's just, uh, you know, him and, uh, you know, tough, tough week for Chicago with Mongo with Steve McMichael. Yeah. Um, you know, getting diagnosed with ALS. Um, Cause you know, everyone, Talk about fan favorites and and hardcore Chicago celebrities who who gave it that all for that that throng of fans that live and die on the gladiator edge. There you go. You know to kind of see you that my language. See that to see that demise. You know, I mean, I and some of those some of those sound bites from Mongo. You know, especially in that. You know, you've seen it all in that that Chicago Bears thirty for thirty. I mean, yeah. some of those. I mean, I'm gonna miss his interviews that are just unbelievable his his charisma and and how he talks and you know yeah so. you know his segue into professional wrestling just was so perfectly fitting i mean oh. the guy whose yeah. personality was cut right. out of the squared circle yeah. in the yep. <laughs> a member of the four he was a member of the four horsemen yeah, yeah. like he was <laughs> he was perfect the 30 for 30 i i watched the 30 for 30 in some of his clips right after the als and some of the things he says about Oh, we'd all do it again in a second. You kind of go, oof, you know, yeah. and now he has ALS, you worry about that. But you know, we talk about the rise and the fall. Go sit on it, anyone who's worried about the fall. Any one of us would do it again. You know, it's just so that. anyway. Josh, Andy, we're gonna come back around on tapes to you. Let's let's keep let's stay on Shaw. Shaw, right. what do you say? Yeah, I'm gonna miss Andrew Shaw. I was at his first game back when he came back with Montreal. And the energy, it was also the Hawks in Montreal were both, I think they were in contention. Like it, it was early on in the season, obviously. And the energy in that building was amazing. And Shaw, Shawzi just brought like that, brought the energy, the, um, the headbutt goal that I put, the non-goal, I put that in the article, the, the shin pads goal in one of the- I love shin pads. <laughs> I love shin pads. Uh, you know, the swear word, shin pads in one of the longest uh, playoff games of all time but also like in that ga in that game he set up Dave Bolin for a goal that led him back too like yeah. he he was a grinder who had a little offensive skill um I was lucky enough to go to the Blackhawks convention the the summer after they won the final Stanley Cup and they had a panel called Cup Keepers and it was all the Cup Keepers and Andrew Shaw and they told a story of how Andrew Shaw had the Stanley Cup and somehow the boat he was on got into like hit something and the boat nearly went down with Andrew Shaw and the Stanley Cup on it. And all the cup, the cup keeper was with him was like, we got to get it out of here. He dreaded what Shaw had the cup. Phil Pritchard. Was it Phil Pritchard? No, it wasn't Pritchard. It was one of the other guys. Okay. I did meet Philip Pritchard, but it was one of the other guys. That's um, awesome. But yeah, they were, they were telling that story. Shaw, it's really sad that Shaw Crawford and Seabrook it's it's like we've said, it's the price of winning. Yeah. Like we, like not only do guys usually get big contracts that are overpaid that 
eventually hampers you from winning in the future, but it's also the physical toll on these guys. Like uh, we remember Shaw had the stitches and took the puck to the face and went down. He, he missed significant time with concussions. Even I think when he came back last year, he missed most of the season due to concussion. So it's good, good on him that he's, he's going to take care of his, his brain because we, there's still so much research on concussions. You don't know. And you don't want to be one of those guys who have gone on too long and uh, who can't, can't utter words and just sit there like like some punch drunk boxer who can't utter words uh and also on mongo when i was in high school there was this there was a study about players in any professional sport if you could take steroid if you could take some drug that made you the top top person in your sport but took five years off your life would you do it it was 90 percent the professional athletes would do it that's just that's just their drive. That's just, there's no, they don't know any other way. Yeah. And then uh, my favorite Mongo story is when he threatened Angel Hernandez at a Cubs <laughs> game while singing the stretch and Angel <laughs> Hernandez threw him, threw out. him out. Yep. yep. Yeah. So that was, yeah. that was pretty interesting, but yeah, yeah. it's very wow. sad. It's very sad to see our, our heroes. Like it, it, it brings a certain mortality to it. Right. And you don't think about it in the moment that like right. these big hits that you're seeing have an effect. It's, it's just, it's sad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Shaw, I mean, you know, I, we really wouldn't be, I think showing him the, uh, the deference that we need to um, by not just having a topic on Shaw. So that's what we're doing. Um, you know, Andy, you used a, a, a great term gladiatorial, you know, and it is good to know that you like movies with gladiators in them. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, hockey is pro- professional hockey. The NHL is, it's a tough, it's a tough game, you know, and uh, you know, Shaw is a guy who chose to play it in a very, very tough way. I mean, Dan Carcillo was right. one of those guys too. And, and Bob Probert, who's, whose Jersey I am rocking tonight, my 1996 Go. road rev, road rev uh, proper 24. Um, but Bob, you know, when he died, um, which was of a heart attack, he, he had massive CTE in his brain and, um, you know, it's, it's, and I, you know, so, so Shaw, I mean, I, I just, the thing about Shaw, I remember a lot of things, the headbutt goal, et cetera. But, you know, I think the thing about Shaw that I will always remember was the, uh, 2014 Western conference finals when he was centering Patrick Kane and Brandon Sod. Yeah. Yep. That, line, like, that line was amazing. Yeah. They, they were pull Shaw was off the ice when they gave up the game winner because they they switched out Hanzu's on the ice. Yeah. And I I remember like Hanzu's on the ice. No, and I was screaming at the TV at the top of my lungs. That line when they put Shaw in the center, those three guys. Sorry, I cut yeah. you off, JJ. Like they just took off in that series. They yeah. did. Like yeah. It, yeah. I mean, Shaw was was one of those guys that he was an old school hockey player, you know, and he would come in. And he would do whatever they asked of him and he would do it well. And, uh, you know, he did have a little bit of offensive ability and um, he could play center and he could play wing. And, uh, you know, uh, I just, you know, he's a guy that um, uh, he was really an important part of both of those cup teams, you know, and, uh, you know, good for him. I mean, and, and I hope, you know, it could, concussions are funny. I mean, some guys um, w- will not have the long-term health health effects that, that some other guys do. And, and, you know, you hope he doesn't. Um, I, sometimes I worry with NHL players, they'll all kind of tend to hang on a little bit too long. Um, you know, boxers, same thing. Uh, it's same as somewhat true of NFL. NFL players like Wes Belker. You know, Shaw got out at the right time. Right, right, right. Yeah. So anyway. Wes Belker, um, I think he had and, five concussions. Oh, yeah. I mean. That they well, know I mean, of. And like two within 24 months. That's yeah. it, but JJ, I'm, I'm glad you brought up and I, I you know, I, I guess I, I, I want to, I owe Shaw a little bit of an apology, tremendously skilled hockey player. I mean, I, I mean, he, he really did. And, you know, I, I'm sorry, I went off on that Mongo tangent, but I remember if anyone remembers that, uh, that goal that Shaw scored in game six of the Western conference finals in 2015, when the game was on the line yeah. and the Hawks were up by one and yeah. Desjardins laid it out in space yeah. and Shaw went to the backhand and went under the bar and uh and went bonkers in the place think about that. bonkers think about that because that line 
Kruger to Jardin Shaw, I mean, which was a totally right. different kind of line. That line was an energy right. shutdown, you know, grind, tough as you know what to play against. And, you know, Shaw was, was a big part of that. And then one year earlier, he's a center driving a, sec, a, a really productive second line with a couple right. of skilled players. No, that's he, huge. That's pretty amazing, you know? Incredible. Yeah. And, and then, I, he was on yeah. the, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Shawnee. He was on the line with, it was him, Bolin, and Kruger at one point, too. Like yeah. he was he he was up and down the like up yeah. and down the top yeah. three lines you could play him yeah. well he has he has that disallowed headbutt goal and then he's right back there on the ice for kruger's game winner in front of that oh, what yeah. a goal that was man yeah, yeah. oh god awesome. that was so, a great i mean guys i we may not see the likes of that for a long no, time he's a beauty it was, it really he, was, was, he, was, he was he was a beaut and i think he also played with an edge because of his size yeah. like he's he's not the biggest guy in the world and yeah. i think like he he played with that edge because he knew he's like if I'm gonna make my mark I've got to let my presence be known whether right. it's getting in front of the net and taking the abuse or you know working in the dirty airs committing the stupid penalty that he was God love him but he always committed the the back the blind side check or something that sent him to the box at an yeah. unopportune moment but I would I wouldn't take I'd take all of it. Yeah. take all of it for Chelsea. He, he had some big moments with with some very very good hockey teams. Couple yeah. of yeah. teams. And I have a feel he said he's not going to he'll be an ambassador, oh, he'll sure. be on TV like that's sure. one thing the Hawks organization has been really good about lately. They take care of their people, they give them they're always still around, they're an ambassador, he'll be signing autographs, he'll be he'll be around. Good point. So, really good yeah. point. Yeah. So we'll save the uh, we'll save the tapes thing for the end because we have a tapes question and that'll be a good time to address that. So let's talk about the extension of Riley Stillman. Um, one of our questions tonight, which I will dive into now, was WA Laxer, our own Eric Andrews, um, <laughs> asked, "Why does Gate hate Riley Stillman so much?" And you know that's sort of like you know why why is the sky blue? Why why are there clouds? Why are there birds? I mean, Gate hates everything, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what the eight Riley Stillman? Um, well, the, but I'll leave that there. Um, so they extended Riley Stillman at a very team friendly, looks like a long run, 1.5, 1.6 million a year for three years. Um, I, you know, if, if Stillman turns, turns into a pumpkin, it's not a huge amount of money to figure out how to get rid of. Um, I think they're looking at him as, you know, a, a number six defenseman. Um, who they can rely on to, to block a lot of shots and uh, maybe to anchor a guy like Bo Twist or to anchor a guy like Wyatt Kalinick or a guy like Ian Mitchell uh, when once he returns from Rockford. So I, I, I think it's fine. I, I do think, yes, it probably does uh, portend the departure of uh, more likely um, Calvin DeHaan, but possibly – the uh, the much maligned Nikita Zadorov, another guy that Gate really hates. Um, so it's to me, it's not earth shattering. I don't think it's a it's a big coup by Stan to, to extend Riley Stillman. Um, but what do you guys think? Um, I, I yeah, I I'm kind of meh about it. I mean, his his sample size is is limited with the Blackhawks. I mean, I I mean, we've seen him for a few games. Um, yeah, maybe the end of uh, Zadarov. I mean, I. Who knows with Big Z what they're going to do? Um, if Dahan is the one that they're going to dangle, who I don't know if they have intentions of maybe moving Dahan to try to get a return on him. But then I don't know who else an expansion team would take. Uh, but I don't know if Stillman. I, <laughs> I think it's a little ambitious to, and I know he's cheap labor and you can move him quickly. But if the idea is to re replace Dahan with Stillman, then I mean that's like that's. I like Riley Stillman, but that's, that's a Walmart, Walmart version of DeHaan. Um, it's not, right. you know, that's Absolutely. not, he's not as good as Calvin DeHaan. He's just not. No, he's not. Um, and so I did, you know, if, if they lose DeHaan or DeHaan goes to these, now DeHaan can be dinged up, you know, I mean, I don't know how much more they'll get out of DeHaan over the next few years because of his shoulder problems and things like that. But I mean, I, I also, you lose DeHaan if that's who they lose in the expansion draft or they move away from him defensively, you do get a little weaker. And you're still weaker, even with Stillman being signed back there. Still so, weaker, weaker still on a weak defensive team. Right, exactly, exactly. So it's like, I mean, I don't, it's one of those, could that waited to see what else is out there <laughs> later on? Um, 
Yeah. But I don't know. We'll see. I, again, I mean, it's 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 cheap and it's it's uh, it's it's a good contract control, I guess, in that sense. Where you say, all right, we have a very limited cap hit of a player that we like you know, for the next three seasons, and that's nice. Um, but I don't know if this is going to be one of those where Colleton and Stan like him and nobody else does. Um, that seems like the Blackhawks of today. But I don't know, yeah. Shawnee. What do you think? Yeah. I don't know if they're exposing Kelvin DeHaan and they're going to replace him with Riley Stillman. That's similar to bringing in Trevor Daly to replace Johnny Odia. They just, they don't fit. They're not the same. Riley Stillman. I've even heard, I even read Ben Pope was tweeting that Stan Bowman said he could even play Zadorov with Zadorov with a Boquist type and then Riley Stillman with a Bodan type. So they could both be, in the mix at the same time, which, boy, they like. Uh, Riley Stillman's a guy. He doesn't move the needle. He's cheap. They're they're going to move up. They're going to move on from another defenseman. I don't know. I don't see why your defensive defensemen have to be pylons, and it feels like that's where we're getting to now. It's like, right. well, we've got these really mobile and uh, great puck carrying offensive defensemen. So we can play them with, with guys who are, you know, tra traffic cones, you know, <laughs> I mean, Nicholas Jalmerson was a hell of a defensive defenseman, but he could also move, you know, he could also make plays in space. Yeah. You know, uh, Johnny and Dewey, same thing. Johnny and Dewey was a brilliant skater. Yeah. Uh, so I, I just feel like, I just feel like, uh, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Dan Bowman guys. I, I don't know. I don't I mean, know what, uh, yeah. <laughs> and the, well, the one defenseman I liked, out of the group, they decided to trade for Alex Nylander. Yeah, so. right. Henry. How, how is he doing in Buffalo anyway? I mean, I don't I don't know, but Buffalo's not doing real well. Yeah, yeah Buffalo. <laughs> that, that, that Buffalo's not play, doing real well, but he no. gets some minutes. And... When rebuilds don't work. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I do wanna I, I do wanna give you know some some credit to I think Connor Murphy's had a really good season. Yep. Uh, Murphy. Yep. You know, but but again, that's an example. That's a that's a 28 year old, mostly defensive defenseman who can contribute a little bit of offensive yeah. upside. And he can skate. He's a decent. And, 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 and he's a, he's a good skater. I mean, he's he's someone who we're gonna want around for a while. Yeah. Um. You know, he's gotta totally, stop hitting people illegally. And we should be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Totally but again, a guy you don't notice much, and that's why he's valuable. Yeah. So I don't know, Stillman. I I don't know. Sometimes he just looks like he's racing around out there a little bit aimlessly, but. So Zadorov just cheaper. Right. And maybe a little bit faster. Yeah. Well, that's, I'm a little bit faster than Zadorov. Yes, that is so. correct. <laughs> um, all right. So we've beaten Riley Stillman to death. Uh, so let's, <laughs> and let's, Nikita Zadorov. Yes. Let's, let's dive into our questions. Um, good question from, from Advest Espinard, uh, Scott, I believe. Given that Taves was out all year and Doc was out most of the year, did you think this team would be as close to the playoffs as they are? I was on the tank train. Um, I was on the tank train too, Scott. Um, I did not think they would be as close to the playoffs as they are. But again, I, I have to echo what these guys said, and I think this is really true. I think that their first half of the season where they over-indexed in three or four critical areas, um, and then they came back to earth, I think that was misleading the first part of the season. Um, they may not be as bad as they've been the last six or seven weeks, but they weren't as good as they were to that point. Um, and so where they are now is probably overall their record when they're going to be about 10th is probably pretty much where they're at. There are some good things to take from this season, but, um, I hear, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to pivot now into the tapes topic and, and I'll let you guys jump in on this one too. Um, so there was this report by Darren Dreger that, you know, if, if Taves uh, continues to progress as he has been with his training, um, he could be back next year. And so six weeks ago, Stan Bowman was saying, I don't know. I, I don't know what's wrong with him. You, I know as much as you guys do. But now we've got this nuanced report from Darren Dreger that that Taves is on this is training and if he continues to progress. So there's a prognosis at this point. There has to be, there has to be a, a medical prognosis. This is a guy who's being paid 10 and one half million dollars a year. And if you don't think the team knows what his medical prognosis is, I got a bridge I want to sell you because the team is paying him that money and, they, and they're paying him that money for another two or three years after this. So my thing is, 
what's the deal? What is the prognosis? And maybe you, maybe you don't, you don't have to come out and say it. There's no law that says you have to, but you've also been saying, well, we don't know what's wrong with him. And we're just hoping he gets better. And, and you know, we all are, everybody is. And, and frankly, hockey or uh, hockey is not as important as the rest of his life. And this is what got me thinking about it before with Andrew Shaw. Um, but I feel like here's the deal. If Andrew Shaw retires, the Hawks are not necessarily going to lose much in ticket sales. They're not going to lose much in, in sponsorships, et cetera. If Jonathan Taves is not coming back, that's a big deal for this franchise. Cause that basically means you might as well blow the whole thing up now and, and start over and really tear it down for a couple of years. Cause you ain't You ain't doing nothing without Jonathan Taves. You're not. You didn't do it this year without him and you got lucky this year and you still didn't, you still didn't make the playoffs. Um, and, and, you know, we found out that, you know, they did overperform earlier in the year. So I, I want to know, I really want to know, and, and I, I have a, I have a theory. I think that there may be some kind of a, uh, lingering con- concussion post concussion type of issue with tapes. I could be wrong, could be way off, but most of the evidence for me is pointing that way. And this is a player who's had several concussions. Um, and if, you know, why don't, but, but the Hawks are not, they're holding things back. And why are they holding things back? Because I think they're worried about the message this is going to send to fans and sponsors who they want to sell tickets to and get to sponsor them. Right. And at the end of the day, the fans deserve better. Um, and, but then at the other side of it is, if you want to keep supporting this as fans, you're going to get what you pay for, you know? Yep. Um, I hope he comes back. I hope he comes back as good as he ever was. I, I have serious doubts in spite of what Darren Dreger threw out there. I really do. He, he may come back, but he may not be back for long. Remember, Corey Crawford missed parts of a, a season and a half, and then he came back and he played reasonably well last year, and then he went to New Jersey this year and said, guys, I can't do it. I'm done. I can't yeah. do it. And he was lights out in the playoffs last year. Yeah, yeah. Corey Crawford was. Yep. And so, I mean, and I just think, all, you know, what we're seeing is they keep, whether it's Brent Seabrook's hips – or it's Andrew Shaw's concussions, it's Crawford's concussions, or whatever's going on with Taves. Um, anybody who's not seeing the writing on the wall now <laughs> with regard to, you know, the, the linchpins of this team's success over the last mm, almost 15 years now, right. um, you, you know, come on, guys, get, get real. And we'll see what happens. But I just, I don't, I feel like the organization is, is really not willing to level with, the, with, with fans and sponsors. And, Guys, if I can figure it out, a lot of people can figure it out. Because yeah. I'm not that smart. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, what, you know, Darren Drager comes out and says, so you're saying there's a chance. Right, right. You know, and that's it. And that's it. That's it. He said, okay, well, you know, the rumors were, okay, his condition, whatever it is, is getting a little bit better. If he continues to improve, then he has a chance of playing hockey next season. So, Which is probably true. Which is probably true. But, but it's conditional. Is, it's conditional, very conditional. It's also being held held very tightly to the chest by the Blackhawks. Yeah, what's wrong? You know, it, do I do I question conspiracy theory in some sense when all of these teams, except for the Blackhawks and the Bulls, are welcoming fans back to their buildings, and while they're trying to say, okay, now we need to up ticket sales for next year, and then you see Jonathan Taves plastered on the front page of the Chicago Sun Times saying maybe this is going to happen. Is there a connection there? It could be. Very well could be. Very well, very well could be. Maybe, maybe some dots to connect there. Very, very possible. And that, that the sometimes thing that was, I was, I was excited about Darren's message. I was, you know, speculative or, you know, speculative, eh, you know, like maybe, maybe not, you know, I'm not going to get my hopes up. And then to see it on the sun times um, to almost try to get people to reinvest in something that was, um, it was almost maddening because I, I don't, and who knows what Taves even thought of that being like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> I'm still trying to get better here. And now it's like, here he comes. Yeah. Right. And that was, I, I was very surprised to see that kind of, uh, to see that kind of ink on it. Um, and uh, I, you know, the media will run with whatever they want to run with. I mean, I, I get oh, sure, it. But, sure. But I don't know, Sean, are we being too negative? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think you're being too negative. I think, Ultimately, it's going to come down to ticket sales. Like we've said, I Stan Bowman, 
and uh, Danny words think they're smarter than all of us. They've always thought they're smarter than all of us. So they think they're just going to pull the wool over our eyes. And Jonathan Taves being on the Sun Times is good for the Blackhawks. It, it's it's they need to be a stream of conscious. They need to be top of mind, especially during baseball season. They've got to be in people's minds. So if him coming back or even them leaking to Darren Dreger that he could be on the road to recovery, it's going to pique people's interest and maybe they're going to be good next year. Lori Lightfoot has said that they're the Blackhawks and the Bulls are going to have, could have fans in the stadium this year. And Ben Pope tweeted out that uh, there's tickets for the final five games being listed on StubHub now. So there's, there's dots connect there that, it's all about the almighty dollar, which is ultimately what owning a sports franchise is about. It's about winning championships and making money yeah, and not and in that order. And so, it's a lot easier when you've got a generational collection of talent like the Hawks had in 2008, 2009. Correct. And correct. They don't have that anymore. And so no. now it's, it's, it's like beg, borrow, plead, steal. <laughs> and, people. And, and to the average, the average fan, like the average Joe Schmo on the street, if you say the Blackhawks are going to say Jonathan Taves and Patrick yeah. Kane. Yeah. And if you don't have either guy, if you don't have one of those guys next year, you're going to lose even the casual fan. So you that's why I'm driving with Kane and Taves drive the nope. Chevy Cobalt, baby. Yeah. Right. Chevy. Yep. You know, yeah. so. All right. No, but I, to but, your point, though, JJ, I hope we're all wrong. I hope he's, I, I do too. I, I, I hope Taves comes, comes back next year and is, and is awesome. Yeah, that's awesome too. Yeah, be I mean, like, and again, I I don't know necessarily that it's some kind of a neurological you know issue related to trauma. I I don't know that, and it could be something else. But my you know if it keeps you out for a year in the prime of your career, and you're the most pro- arguably the most competitive player who's right. played in the NHL for the last decade, yeah. I mean it, it's it, it's got to be serious. Yeah, yeah, you know. So right. anyway. All right, so one last question. This is from David Cavazzuti, DPC 999999. Um, question Talk for you. Of a walkie talkie. Yeah. Uh, question for you guys. One, did this is in, in reference to the, the Stillman signing. Did Stan rush this? Um, and then two, assuming Zadorov is gone. Did Stan rush this? Eh, maybe. You know, I I I personally believe that Stan has a tendency to to want to like you know, sign a guy to a contract before the, the, the fax has reached the league office on a trade, you know, it's like a Nisimov was signed, I believe the right. next day after they acquired him when he had a year left on his contract. So does, you know, is Stan trying to kind of gild the lily here and, and make it look like Riley Stillman is, is a guy that you really want to lock up long-term and that makes his trade look good. And eh, maybe, I don't know. It's if it was a lot more money, I'd be more concerned about him rushing it. I, yeah. you know, and, and, Evidently, they've seen enough to believe this is a guy they want to have around in some kind of a, you know, depth defensive role. Um, is that a mistake? Maybe, but it's not. It won't be a costly mistake if it is. No. So I'm not gonna, gonna. I'm not gonna skewer them on that. What do you guys think? Yeah, I wouldn't put the rush order tag on it. I wouldn't. I, I, I think it's. I, I mean, I think it's. This will not. If if I, uh, you know, on my deathbed when I'm scrutinizing Stan Bowman for all of his wrongdoings, this will not make the list, regardless of what happens with Riley Stillman. I just, you know, it's it's a little over a million dollars for three years. Good cap control, good cost containment, and if he pans out, great. If he doesn't, um, I've got bigger, bigger axes to grind. Uh, yeah, than like Stillman. don't throw. Right. Oh yeah. 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 Yep. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm on board with Andy there. It's. Yeah, Stan Bowman signed a guy who, before the end of the year, him and his agent, he probably called his agent, like, 1.3 sound good? The agent was like, I'll take it. And there we go. Yeah, That was the end of it. And then the second part of the question was, is that assuming that Zadarov is gone? I don't don't think think Zadarov will, you know, get the the Stan Bowman nine lives treatment. Because, you know, Stan expended a pretty darn good NHL player and then by the name of Brandon Saad um, to get Zadarov. And um, although there were some cap savings there, which, again, now comes back to the almighty dollar, mm-hmm. um, I think Zadarov will be given a few lives uh, in Chicago and he'll be given several chances to prove he's, he's not good. Isn't that such a great philosophy? Just continue to justify a bad trade. Yeah. <laughs> A double down yeah. don't, don't yeah don't be accountable and say this wasn't the right thing to do let him go let's just uh, come on at some point buddy it's got to work out come on we're uh, still just playing that hand at the blackjack table we're running out of money but let's keep that 
Yeah. We lost the well, house. Let's keep that. I don't know what you guys think. I, I don't think, I think Dehan is probably the, the odd man out. And I think yeah, it's because his shoulder it's is being held together by coat hangers and, and spit and toilet paper. It's um, wishful thinking for people to think the door off is going to be gone. It's my wishful thinking because I want him gone, but I don't think he's going to go. Well, I'm with Gate. I hate him. But the thing is, Riley Silver though, is that people are talking about. Well, he's due for a raise. I mean, what are we talking about giving him here? That's what I'm oh, worried about. Well, like, he was at if, three if he stays three. fine. If it's to the tune of three mil plus, that's what it was this year. It was three point two something that's, this year. And people are talking raise with him. That's They're talking I'm, like if people are saying four or five. Some people are even saying oh, yeah. six million. That's, see, that's outrageous. If that I, it, exactly. That's why I th- maybe Stan signed him as an insurance policy, too, in that if he Zadorovs is like, I want five million, he'd be like, All right, you're on the next, right. you're on the next bus to Buffalo. Here you go. I yeah. Mean, it, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Two big hits a year is not worth five million a year. No. 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 Not at all. I mean, I, being I don't. A, yeah. Being a turnstile po- or turnstile is not worth it either. No. No, I mean, who who's out there on the UFA market this year? I mean, you probably have to wait until after the expansion draft, after the real draft, you know, to to see what you can do and how you could work with it. But yeah, you know, and the thing about UFA too is, I mean, even if the Hawks have a crap ton of, of cap money, first of all, I don't see them spending up to the cap until they until you know some of their underlying economic factors improve. Um, right. I, I don't see that, but but. Um, the other thing, but there's UFA, if you great players or really good players or emerging good players in UFA, you always end up overpaying, you know? Right. And I remember like when they, when they, when they signed Brian Campbell, okay, they overpaid there, but they had to, because they were a franchise that at that time, no free agents wanted to come to. And Brian Campbell was right. a marquee free agent that summer in 2008. So they overpaid to get Campbell and everybody's like, Whoa. Blackhawks are like playing some serious ball here. Right. That, you know? That's what you have to do in professional sports. Like if you want a serious free agent, you're going to overpay and the back end of the deal is going to look terrible. Right. But that's right. what you do. Like that's how you make your prep. Like Marion Hosa was another people probably said that was an Marion Hosa is a great player, but the length of his deal was super long. And that's what people criticized when they gave it to him. So but know, I was free really, agents. Go ahead. Gen, generally in any sport, hockey, any sport, you want to develop your guys and then re-sign your guys. That's yeah. the best way to win. If you're yeah. going to overpay and buy guys in free agency, you you have to overpay yeah. because you're not going to get them otherwise. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I never felt that way about the host of deal though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, was going to use I was going to use host as an example of a right. free agency move that you make when you are one player away. And right. that's, the Hawks really yeah. kind of were there in right. 2000, in the summer of 2009, you know, they needed that great complimentary defensive forward and Hey, another a guy who can also, you know, pitch in 30, 35, 40 goals a year too. Right. You know, if he has a good year. And, and um, you know, the leadership that he brought to the table, which they were still a very young team then that was just a terrific move to, to oh, bring. Yeah. Those oh, it's yeah. the, yeah. You, it's you pay a 30 year old future hall of famer. You just do it. Yeah, right. It's it's <laughs> one of the best free agent signings in all of Chicago's sports and I'm, by I'm, far. I'm still not over it. You know, some people never get over Nam or they're, the night that their band opened for Nirvana. I'm never going to get over Marion Hosa. No, me either, man. I, I no, I man. bought, I, I made them. sure oh, to snag oh. one of the Reebok jerseys when they were on sale right before they got rid of them all. Just I was yeah. like, I don't have one. I, I've got to get one. Yeah. yeah. I loved I love that guy and, and you know him and, and John Emerson and and Marcus Kruger were my three favorite Hawks of the yeah. Cup era, you know right. and uh, um, yeah yeah but but I guess so getting back to free agency I could see the Hawks making a big splashy move that fills one of those really key roles like a number one defenseman like you know, Ham- two Dougie. way number one defenseman indisputable uh, Dougie Hamilton would be good I think right center. Good. You know, like a really top-notch first or second line center, a guy who can win, you know, 50, 55 percent in the, in the faceoff dot. Right. You know, plays the game at both ends and maybe overspend a little bit. You know, I could I could see either of those kinds of moves, but but the bottom line is you got to be doing it by by a draft and you got to be doing it by a trade. Yeah. And you're not going to do it with second round draft picks as much as everybody no. wanted to do a victory parade for Stan Bowman getting a second round pick. 
for uh, Matias Yanmark. You're not going to do it with second round picks. Well, no. what did I say? 35% chance they make the NFL, the right. NHL, right. 35%. And a 10% chance they make the NFL if they could play football. Yeah, so. I mean, hey, you never know. Right. Is it so who – okay, assuming Keith and Kane aren't going anywhere, who who could be a good bargaining chip? That's the biggest question. You don't have anybody. There, you don't the only have one I could think of is Bodan, and that's the only one that comes to mind. But I don't want to see him gone. I really like Bodan. I think he's got uh, some – I do too. Problems, but I don't, uh, I don't think Colleton thinks very highly of him, and – the only thing you can get for Bodan is probably package that second in him only to move up in the draft. That's yeah. it. You're not going to get no. like a top line NHL player and trade for Nicola Bodan at this point. You're just not, You're not getting I mean, any Mantha in return. Right. No. right. Or, uh, yeah. Or whoever. yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, it's so these are all, this is all good conversation, but we keep coming back to is this, this conundrum of, are they going to get serious about this at some point and really start to, you know, put the chips on the table and we'll see. Uh, so did you guys have anything else? Cause we could start to wind this thing up. I think I'm good. All right. I'm, I'm good. I'm just, I was just perusing the free agents just to see who's going to be out there in terms of, I mean, yeah. And if any of you out there haven't seen the latest, uh, quote about Alexander McGilney and an argument with Mike Keenan, uh, on spit and chicklets, uh, it's all over Twitter. You should read it. I got to see that. Yeah, it's, I got to see uh, that. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to give it away, but Alexander McGillney, basically Keenan went at him and McGillney explained to him very gently about what I've been through in my life and why I'm not scared of you. Huh. Nice. So if you, if you can find it, it's, uh, it just got texted to me from a buddy. And um, I guess I, from, I guess Adrian O'Coin mentioned it in Spit and Chicklets and it's a, uh, so Travis Green is the head coach of the Vancouver Canucks, correct? Yes. Is that right? He's head coach of somebody. So okay. I remember back like uh, this, this was sometime in the 90s um, when Mike Milbury called him a gutless little puke. <laughs> oh, hockey's good. There's just some great stuff in hockey. Yeah, that happened. Uh, it really is. He there is the current good. head coach of the Canucks. Yeah. Yep. And George and he, Mack, he, he, he had some awesome – Back in the day, he had some awesome flow. He still got some decent flow going on. Travis Green? Yeah. yeah. Whenever I hear his name, though, I think he's a gutless little puke. And I have no, I have no opinion on Travis Green. I just remember <laughs> that quote. And right. Mike Milbury's an idiot, so he's probably that's probably a bad call. But. Mike Milbury, I instantly think of him saying, I can't even remember who it was, but a team in the playoffs winning the game, and they would earn two points. And I was, I was like <laughs> – Wait, what? <laughs> like, how do you earn? There's no points in the playoffs. Uh, That's just hockey. He, he's probably still calling the Islanders, telling them to make trades. You know? yeah. Non McGillney, I'm, I'm I always follow the the Hall of Fame inductions in the summer. I'm always glued to that. And obviously, last summer we just talked about Marion Hosa and Dougie Wilson getting in. Yeah. The fact yeah. that Alexander McGillney is not in the Hall of Fame and how he got to the NHL and what he yeah. had to go through and what he did and to be a trailblazer in a 72 goal season. And yeah, I think he's the high, is he the highest rushing scoring winger in NHL history? Probably maybe Fedorov has that belt. I think Fedorov. Yeah. But the fact Speaking that of- Alexander McGillney as a, as an ambassador and trailblazer for the sport is not in the hall of fame. is just criminal. There is a good, there is a good documentary on the Russian five. Oh, it's good on- stuff. Yeah. on amazon prime yeah. and if you so if you own amazon prime you can watch it's really really good yeah, and man. Then, detroit during that era that was that was fun yeah was, yeah i hated really, them but i respected them man they played they played some great hockey also. yeah that was really cool just to watch that and then i yeah. think i might read because there's i'm i'm big into reading and there's not really that many good hockey books out there i mean there's the game obviously that's so good which is such a great book so but, good. I have to read it again, actually, I think. But other than that, there's really not like like a must read. So there's there's a book on the Russian five I might read. Yeah, That's man. where I was going with that. All right, one. It might take me 20 years. I'll call you. If if I do, I'll make sure to uh, you know put a forward by Ray Napientek. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It'll, it'll, the only the only thing in the forward will be a, a free Delia hashtag. The title, the title of the book will be Me and Dylan Strom. Right? <laughs> <laughs> me and Dylan Strom. By Ray Andy, and, 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 the, and the sequel will be Me and Ann, uh, Ian Mitchell by Ray Navientech. Yeah. Oh, me and Ian. Ian and me. Ian and me. 
Oh, gosh. All right. We're going to wind this thing up. This has been a, a fun evening. We want to thank our listeners, all 17 of them, for, uh, for, for joining us. You can also um, download and listen to us on iTunes um, and other uh, podcast platforms. Um, Gate will have to fill you in on those. I don't, I don't get into that level of detail, but it's all great. Um, Spotify, iTunes. Spotify, uh, all, that, all that stuff, tough guy. Um, <laughs> I want to thank the usual suspects, or at least two-thirds of them, Andy Campbell and Sean Fitzgerald, for joining me tonight um, to dissect these various topics. Um, I want to thank our founding sponsors since 2017, puckhockey.com. See, there you go, right on. The, you can get the rink line, use that T-H-E-R-I-N-K discount code, not only on rink gear, but all the puck hockey gear, including this sweet Marion Hosa flat brim I'm rocking tonight. See, Big Hoss 81, there you go. Um, yeah. Use that T-H-E-R-I-N-K dis discount code to get 10% off at puck hockey. Great people, great gear. Um, guys, you got anything you want to add? Nope. Go Hacks. Mortal Kombat wasn't as bad as everyone said it was. There Good to go. know. Duly noted. Um, follow us on the Twitters at Jekyll, J-A-E-C-K-E-L, at Diesel. D-I-E-S-A-L-3426. Dissol. 3426. <laughs> and at Dissol. Andy Campbell 16. There you go. Um, all, all of our rink um, accounts as well. Um, the rink, rink Seattle, rink Columbus, rink Toronto, rink Colorado. Yes, even, even the rink Colorado. Um, just kidding, Aaron. We love you, buddy. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you all for joining us tonight. And we will see you next time on the rink. <laughs>